Today we'll be hearing from Diana Falzone, a TV personality and reporter, and her experience of endometriosis. So welcome, Diana. Thank you. And can you start by telling us where you're from and what you do? I am from New York, New York, and I am a reporter and host. Awesome. What did you know about endo, if anything, before your diagnosis? I knew very little about it. I heard uh, from people that it was terrible cramps and bleeding, and I always had pictures in my mind of a woman with a hot water bottle kind of rocking. But other than that, I didn't understand the severity of it, how debilitating it could be, or any of the implications it had. Do you have any symptoms, or were you mostly asymptomatic? I was asymptomatic, but looking back, and obviously, you know, hindsight's mm -hmm. twenty twenty. Looking back, there were so many times I was sick as a little girl, um, having my period, and not putting things together, and being told by doctors, "Oh, you have ovarian cysts, and you just must have had one pop." Now, looking back, that was a big sign of endo. Walk us through now that you um, so you've had some symptoms down. It kind of comes and goes. Puberty. Walk us through what it's like on a, a typical day when you might have a flare up. Well, I've been really lucky. Uh, it sort of. <laughs> I've had two surgeries for endometriosis in a year and two months, which is a lot. Um, but a typical flare for me usually starts on my right side, which is where my problem has been. And it feels as though there's a hot burning piece of coal in my abdomen that's just pulsating as if someone's taking a knife and, and bringing it down. It's a kind of pain that only women with this disease can understand. And when did you first notice this kind of pain or kind of when would it start affecting your life? It started Hopefully. affecting my life. It was a sudden onset, and it was my mom's birthday in uh, February of 2016. And we took her out for our birthday brunch, and she noticed something was wrong with me. And I said, I'm not feeling well. She said, you have no color in your face. And I thought, well, maybe I have a virus. And the next day while I was at work, um, I had a kind of pain that I've never felt before. It was the pain I described with the the burning and the stabbing, and then I had heavy bleeding, which was not my time of month to have that, and I got very alarmed and knew something was wrong and I needed immediate attention. And walk us through the steps of seeing doctors or getting any feedback, diagnosis. One thing that became incredibly frustrating and disheartening was going to an ER in New York City and having a general practitioner who really had no business being in my business um, telling me that he thought my pain and my other symptoms were uh, a hormonal imbalance and the flu. And I've had the flu before. This was not the flu. Women know the difference between having the flu and having something serious going on in their bodies. Um, I asked to see a gynecologist. He told me there was no one available in all of this big, fancy Manhattan hospital. I asked one of my girlfriends to visit me there, accompany me there to be a stronger voice. And he kind of poo-pooed us and told me to go home and see my gynecologist in the morning, which I had to fight for an appointment. And when she did see me, she said she could find nothing wrong. The word endometriosis was never mentioned. She just said I looked very sick. I had a fever and I should go home and rest and bleed it out. Were the reactions of your family, friends, community members similar, or did you find that they had different responses? No, I am very lucky to have awesome parents and loved ones and an incredibly supportive boyfriend. And I'm not one to have really any medical issues. I usually power through things, which I think a lot of females do, um, which is not always a good thing. And uh, most everyone was really concerned, really concerned and knew that they they needed to help me get to the bottom of this. Once you realize that this doctor is telling you to bleed it out and giving you these crazy um, ideas, what were your next steps? Did you how do you react to that emotionally? My well, I was really upset, really upset because I thought to myself, I'm not a hysterical person. Um, I trade in facts for my living. So I research and analyze, and I was researching and analyzing myself. And I went to um, some of my friends that I thought knew enough about the health profession, and they were able to get me into very knowledgeable hands where it was going to this new gynecologist within two and a half minutes of her doing a transvaginal 
um, ultrasound, she said, you have a mass in your uterus. And it was at that point, my knees were buckling. And when you hear mass, you don't know if that means a tumor. You don't know if that means cancer. You just know in that moment that your life has changed. Were you ever told that you had a different disease or just that you had the mass? Um, at that moment, no. Um, I was not told I had a different disease. She suspected it was endometriosis. It was at that point where she said we need to do an AMH test, which is an anti-malarian hormone test, um, because she believed that something was attacking my fertility as well. And we had to get down to the bottom of that. And how did you first treat endometriosis? I ended up having to go right in for emergency surgery relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. It was within a number of, of days. It was um, pain that was about a nine and completely crippling. It was, it was really tough. Most people talk about birth control and different options and hot packs and different things they try over time. But it seems like for you it was a really quick process. It was. It kind of was like... Boom, you have endo. <laughs> and it, was, it wasn't a nice greeting, let's say that. Um, but between, you know, going from the doctor's appointments, being seen by specialists, and getting into the hospital for surgery, uh, even to this day, I like have a whoopee, my security blanket or my eating pads. I mean, I, I slept with one last night. It's just, it's the only thing that really gives you immediate comfort other than like an ibuprofen, which really doesn't do much. Yeah. <laughs> not for not for stuff like lesions growing on your organs, you know. <laughs> Were you nervous for surgery? And I was, yeah, I was nervous, but I was in such excruciating pain that I felt like relief. I thought, if this is what's going to fix me. And I remember um, I'm such a work addict that I was doing emails in the ER, like to work and finishing up a story. And the nurse took my phone and then said, you're going in the OR. And I went, huh? And immediately I was raised in a Catholic religion. I did the sign of the cross and I was like, okay, God, like, don't let me lose my reproductive organs. Because for me, um, it's always been, my career's always been incredibly important, but I always imagined being a mother and with endometriosis, it has potentially robbed me of that. So that in itself has been an extremely hard journey that I've been continually going through, trying to fight to become a mom one day. How have you come to terms with that or reflected on it over the past um, year? I've reflected on it a great deal, for sure. Uh, but I haven't given up. So I refuse to believe it's not going to happen. And I'm working with really wonderful uh, reproductive immunologist and, and specialist so that I can become a mom. And after surgery, what were your uh, feelings, um, both physically and emotionally? After surgery, um, the first, I had two. So after the first one, I was in I was in a lot of pain, so I was concerned that I wasn't fixed, that I wasn't better, and that was a, a very big concern of mine. But as the days went on, I started feeling that relief, that stopping pain was leaving my body. Um, but I still wasn't a hundred percent. I went back to work after ten days and, and had trouble walking and was hobbling around. But it's that mentality of you just have to keep on keeping on. Um, what I did know is and learn through this process is that it's very important for women with endometriosis that are still having symptoms to go and see a physical therapist because there is a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction and a lot of pain referral, especially for women that have had endo for years and years and have been contorting their bodies in certain ways. Um, in order to get through the pain. So for me, going to PT has been a really big helper. Were there any other surprising insights from your endo journey? Uh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are not ready to hear about women's health, and that's been surprising to me. But another amazing thing about uh, the endo journey is the community of women who are there to support each other and medical specialist and as much as we talk about women having each other's back in this community there's so many caregivers and men that have been there i mean my dad my brother my boyfriend have learned so much about women's reproductive organs because of this and have been there to comfort me and and hold my hand my boyfriend has been through both surgeries has fallen asleep at the hospital in uncomfortable chairs and 
letting me know before my second surgery that whatever the outcome was, he was going to be there. And uh, that's been incredible. Do you have any advice for other parents, partners, how to help a loved one with endometriosis? Listen, there's so many emotions that go on with being sick. I once heard someone say when when someone in the family gets sick, you all get sick. And that's, that's true. Um, but when you're a caregiver, it's difficult to difficult to not get emotional. I know for my mom, it was an incredibly emotional journey and she took a lot of the onus on herself. Like, why didn't I pay attention to your symptoms when you were 11, 12, 13? I said, how could you have possibly known? And I think there's this guilt from, from mothers especially that they should be doing more for their daughters. But if you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the know-how. So the best thing you can do is listen and learn and learn as you go because we don't have all the answers. I'm learning every day about this illness. I'm a newbie to it. It's only been a year and a half for me. Um, and every day I'm learning more about how my body works, about how this, how this illness works, and about what I can be doing to even help women in this community. Do you have any suggestions for resources for adolescents or young women going through puberty and thinking they might have endo? endofound.org <laughs> and I'm not saying that because I'm trying to give a shout out but I actually before I knew anything about this foundation um, as soon as I heard the word endometriosis and I had it I went right on the website and you learn the symptoms you learn where you can go for more information and it's a huge help what reactions do you see now when you tell people you have endo <laughs> There's, um, I don't want to say that endo is becoming a fashionable disease because that sounds awful, but people are talking about it. So now it's a buzzword and that means that we're getting the attention that we so deserve. Um, you could change one thing about our culture, healthcare, education that could impact endo. Just one thing? <laughs> Just one thing. Or two or three. Um, gosh, I think... There's a lot of stigmas about women's reproductive health. I think that we've politicized the disease so much. Anything below the waist, as a really doc, a great documentary, and a what talks about, is uh, is kind of radicalized and and become too provocative when it's really just about making sure that women lead their best, most healthy, most productive lives. And uh, endo takes a lot of that away when you can't function as your best self. So I think it's please pay attention to us healthcare providers. Please don't ignore us. Don't say that we're crazy or it's all in our head just because we don't look sick. We're sick and we need the help. And what are your dreams for the future for in 20 years or 30 years, how endo looks in our culture and healthcare? I hope that endo is something that is widely known about and discussed and that there will be better tests so that we don't have to go under the knife to actually get a proper diagnosis and that maybe one day there won't be only surgery as a way to to help the disease and remember there's there's no cure right now so i would love to say in 20 years that endometriosis is a disease that we have a cure to for all your endo sisters out there what do you like to tell them if you have Something to say, give me some advice from your experience. Never doubt yourself. Always listen to that inner voice, no matter what doctor is telling you that you're fine and just go home and bleed it out. Always advocate for you. And if you can't do it for yourself, ask a friend, ask a loved one to be in the room at the hospital or the doctor's office so you feel more empowered. But always fight for you and your health. Never, ever, ever be sorry for that. Anything else you'd like to say about your story or for our listeners? As difficult as it has been to live with endo, I have encountered some incredible people and made strong friendships that could rival friendships that I've had for 10, 15 years because there is a bond when you meet someone with a chronic illness that's invisible, that's very very little is understood about it. So I'm thankful for it. And I'm thankful for the ability to talk about my journey in hopes that not only do we raise awareness, but that people just don't feel alone because there are a lot of women out there, and I've seen this on social media, that feel so isolated and so misunderstood. And just know that you're, that you're, not, that you're not alone. Okay, great. Thank you.